Welcome to today's meeting of the Voters of Moscow presentation. I'm Chris Sobel. I'm on the Chris, do, we, do we need to speak to the back row? Okay, I'm trying. I'm doing my best. I don't have a projecting voice. I guess no. <laughs> <laughs> Today we're hosting two women who are staunch defenders of the right to read. They will be talking about how Idaho public and school libraries have become embroiled in the legislative effort to place boundaries on the right to read. Before retiring, Heather Stout, the blonde, <laughs> was a librarian for many years at the Lewiston Library with a focus on early literacy and um, youth services. She became a librarian because of her deep belief that a well-informed citizenry is the basis for our democracy. <clears throat> Heather has planned and taught numerous youth programs at the local, state, and regional level, as well as serving on the boards of state and regional library organizations. Marianne Funk taught high school English in Kansas and later served for 34 years as a school librarian for the Lewiston School District at both elementary and high school levels. <clears throat> Now also retired, Marianne has seen her share of challenges to materials in school libraries. Heather's and Marianne's passion for intellectual freedom for all has led them to launch the um, North Central Idaho Alliance, a group dedicated to libraries in the region and the public's right to read. The Alliance was formed in 2023 under the umbrella of Fight for the First, a national organization with the goal of helping communities act in defense of the constitutional right to read. Nope, I got a big <laughs> loud voice. This book is banned. What the heck is a banned book anyway? Well, it's when one group of people decides that no one should be allowed to read a certain book. And they try to remove that book from libraries and schools. These folks might not agree with something the author wrote, but everyone should be allowed to share their opinions as long as they're not hurting others. If we only read books that we already agreed with, we'd never learn anything new. <laughs> Batty books is downright dangerous, and if you make it to the end of this book, you might just find out why. Now this book was written by Raj Haldar, and it bans avocados, and it bans birthday cakes, and it bans all sorts of things. And the reason he wrote this is because he had written this book prior to it. It's a wonderful um, alphabet book. It's a piece for a pterodactyl. It's all about like silent letters and weird English spellings and all that good stuff. And so in O, this is what got it banned. O is for a Ouija. <laughs> the French Leopard says, Woo! Away! We love to play a Ouija with a wee witch from Oaxaca. <laughs> so, not only is there a witch, the Ouija game that we play at Halloween sometimes, this book was banned by a, because of that. And that's why he wrote that book. So, um, thank you so much for inviting us to speak this afternoon. We truly, truly appreciate this opportunity to get our message out. Um, an outline of kind of what we're going to talk about today includes the effects of censorship on both school and public libraries, uh, the costs associated with that, and how you can help. And we have left time for Q&A as well. We're going to start off this afternoon by talking about Fight for the First. Chris told you a little bit about that. Fight for the First was developed by every library. Every library is a 501c4 national organization. It's dedicated to ensuring continued public and 
political support of libraries and library funding. Fight for the First enables and empowers communities to act in defense of their constitutional right to free speech. Now, several area librarians, as well as a bunch of local concerned citizens, came together in the early spring of 2023 to create the Fight for the First North Central Idaho Alliance. Why? Because we were all worried about the May 2023 library elections, as well as in response to the Idaho legislature's attempts to restrict access to library materials. Now that was HB 666 in 2022, HB 341 in 2023, and of course now we have another one. We are now we are one of four fight for the firsts. Excuse me, we're one of four fight for the first alliances in the state of Idaho. Um, and Marianne and I are the original co-founders, along with Brian Potter, who's a retired English teacher from Potlatch, and Sally Perrine, who's a retired E from University of Idaho. On our site, it states that we are a group of neighbors across the North Central Idaho region dedicated to our libraries and the right to read. So we want you to join us. We developed a petition that has over 350 signatures and a database of members ready to work hard to make sure our constitutional right to free speech is defended. After two years of constant attacks on our Idaho libraries, the members of the North Central Idaho Alliance are committed to help educate, empower, and mobilize our communities in preparation for this legislature. We've already gone down that path last week and the week before with HB 341. But we need to be, have all of our ducks in a row to be successful. So let's get started. Marianne's gonna talk a little bit about school libraries, but I wanted to let you know that on Saturday, January 13th, there was a huge Idaho Freedom to Read in down in Boise, Idaho. There were all, close to 400 people that came to the Capitol to listen to authors, to listen to people, um, to legislators um, about your right to read. It was highly successful the following Monday when the bill, the current bill came up, there were 400 people that signed up against the bill. So we are making up, we're making a difference and um, we welcome you to join us. Um, I echo Heather's thanks in having us here today. This is really nice and it's kind of cool for me because my grandma was a big reader when we voted. <laughs> One thing about the rally down in Boise that was really a bummer for us is, you know, it was during that big snowstorm. Yeah. And so the north got cut off from getting down there. But still to have that many people show up in Boise when they were also getting hammered was pretty amazing. And I do want to say that Lori McCann spoke at that, Representative Lori McCann spoke in favor of libraries. So that was cool. Okay. <laughs> So I'll get started. My years as a Idaho um, high school librarian were incredibly rewarding. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. No. No? Okay. Thank you. I, where we put it? Right here. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh, good. It worked. That'd be bad if I couldn't turn them off. <laughs> Sadly, today, though, when I talk to librarians, they report that they are working in an environment of fear. And that goes for the teachers, the administrators, and everyone. School librarians are accused of being groomers, porn pushers, you heard it, these are monikers. None of us got into the business to be labeled. And yet it happens. Take a minute to think back to your own school days and library experiences. Maybe you recall the library as a treasure trove of knowledge, imagination, and growth. Or maybe it was a place to go work on a dreaded research paper, meet up with your friends, skip class. <laughs> <laughs> Fundamentally, a school library is a place where young minds can embark on adventure, discover new ideas, and develop a love of learning and really experience the world outside of their community, their state, their region. It's so important because of that. 
As the League of Women Voters, you all share a common belief in creating welcoming and inclusive communities. Your nonpartisan club works to uphold voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. So it's essential to address this issue of book banning that threatens those very values you hold dear, specifically the First Amendment. I'm gonna share from the Lewiston School District. I'm quite confident based on what I know of when I was working that Moscow School District has similar things going on. So I wanna quickly share that the Lewiston School District has as part of their governing rules and regulations policies, a sound library collection development policy. This policy promotes three major things. One, a strong standard for supporting the curriculum and the recreational reading interests of the students. It supports academic freedom, and as with any sound library policy, a procedure for handling challenged materials. In my 34 years as a school librarian in Lewiston, I had two incidences where the challenge procedure took place. I won't get into the details of those right now, except to report that both challenges resulted in materials being retained in the library. Friends, no student is ever forced to read something they don't want to read. If a parent doesn't want their child to read anything about any topic, librarians will accommodate those requests. We've been doing it forever. Librarians will also preserve the rights of other students to continue accessing those materials. Claims of pornography in school libraries are patently false. Something that challenges your belief systems or makes you uncomfortable cannot be automatically labeled pornography. If that were the case, I would call books about snakes pornography. <laughs> <laughs> Book vendors selling to school libraries are not selling porn. That would be illegal. School libraries, especially at the secondary level, do have books dealing with drug addiction, sexual abuse, rape, and sexuality. This is nothing new. What is new is one politician or small vocal group imposing their re reading per permissions excuse me, on all students. I have had numerous times in my career where students share that some of these books that are being challenged most these days help them through hard, lonely journeys. Books have helped students better understand what others have been through. How is that bad? The bottom line again, is no librarian ever forces a student to read something they don't want to read. All students deserve to see themselves reflected in the stories on the shelves of our libraries. School libraries with robust collections can encourage students to read critically, to question, and to engage with diverse perspectives. That is a really good thing, especially in a society that is as divided as ours is. Our school libraries are more than just repositories of books. They are sanctuaries of safety and acceptance. Libraries provide free resources to low-income students and family, families. Additionally, a recent survey revealed that 90% of LGBTQ plus students feel safe in their school libraries. These libraries provide a refuge where students can find books that resonate with their experiences, helping them navigate a world where their community doesn't always understand or accept them. Students need awareness and sometimes gay students particularly feel unaccepted by their families and their faith communities just because of who they are. Will students see themselves reflected in any of the fiction or nonfiction resources available in the library, or will they be erased? I haven't even mentioned attempts to curtail books and resources about the difficult parts of our country's history dealing with people of color. 
I recall something my husband, also a retired social studies teacher, said about these issues. Although the teenagers of the Little Rock Nine were strong enough to integrate Central High School in 1957, people today think they're not strong enough to learn about it. <laughs> Some politicians, watchdog groups, and officials are discuss discussing age-related library, age-restricted library cards, limiting access to certain materials based on age. Personally, I feel this to be unnecessary. It would be extremely hard to enforce in a school where you have varying reading levels, maturity levels, and all sorts of things. Also, parents, as stated early, can control what their children have access to. When I hear age-related or age-restricted library cards, it feels to me that we're outsourcing the responsibility of guiding our children's reading choices to the librarian <clears throat> and not the parents. Ideally, I would like to see parents and their children engage in meaningful conversations about what they're reading and handle the issue in that manner. All good things will come from those kind of discussions. Our, school and our schools and school libraries play a vital role in shaping the future of our communities. communities. Banning books is a concerning issue because it threatens the very essence of education, the free exchange of ideas, critical thinking, and empathy. Let's raise and support our children to be curious, informed, and compassionate individuals who can navigate a diverse and complex world. Together, we can foster an environment where everyone feels welcome, where we seek to understand one another, where we contribute to the growth of a vibrant, kind, and thriving society where everyone who can feels. <laughs> public librarian and uh, my specialty was children's and youth services and unlike school libraries public libraries do not specifically follow curriculum requirements their mission is much broader and it encompasses the entire community and it is of course accessible to all not only do public libraries provide books and materials but they also provide a variety of programming including author visits book talks story times some of those are coming under under uh, uh, attack as well. In addition, public libraries provide com computer access to the surrounding com community. This is a really vital need um, in Idaho because not everyone has internet access, especially our really small rural communities. Materials found in the public library are organized by age levels. Usually there's a children's area, a young adult area, an adult area. Material selection is outlined in the library's collection development policy, just as Marianne addressed in school libraries. So these policies include a request for reconsideration policy that enables individuals to challenge materials. So as you can see, both school and library, school libraries and public libraries, we already have policies to address these issues. But as book ban legislation increases across the nation, so do the costs. And we would like to share with you a few examples. So the Washington Post studied over 1,000 book challenges and they found that 11 people were behind the complaints. 11, okay? In one Utah school district, a couple was behind 199 out of 205 challenges. The district reported that the challenges required 10,000 hours, <clears throat> excuse me, of staff time and a cost of more than $100,000. So in Texas, documents show that more than 16 employees spent over 225 hours at a cost of $30,000 on a single book challenge at the Spring Branch Independent School District. Now I ask you, is that a good use of your taxpayer money? 
Politico recently published an in-depth article that reported the following. A key component of Florida House Bill 1069, signed into law by, in May, last May, by Governor Ron DeSantis, requires books that depict or describe sexual content to be pulled from school classrooms and library shelves pending review, okay? So now, while this is happening, kids in Florida do not have access to any of the materials questioned until a full review of each and every book is completed by a media specialist. Now that works out to be over a million books to be review, reviewed every year. It's an impossible task. Now NPR had an update to this story just last month on December 23rd, and I quote, some of this, some 673 books have been removed from classrooms in Orange County, that includes Orlando, this year, over concerns they could violate a new state law related to inappropriate content. Now, the librarians down there, they're pretty fearful. They're fearful of losing their jobs. They don't know what to do. And so some books are being banned that you go, so I don't know how many of you know, know David. He's really naughty, and he does all sorts of naughty things. It was a Caldecott honor, and this particular this was banned in Florida because of his tush. So that that's what we're talking about. And actually, the before it was pulled and put back into committee, the current law 341 here in Idaho, you could not show this because any a breast or any type of genitalia or your rear end, if it was not covered by an opaque covering, it was considered to be obscene and shouldn't be in the library. Okay, I think I got that point across. <laughs> I know. However, <laughs> in a recent survey of parents put together by Pantheon Books, Book Riot, and Every Library, they revealed the following. 90% of parents trust their children to select appropriate materials from the library. That includes books, magazines, movies, audiobooks, etc. And 92% of parents trust librarians to recommend age and content appropriate books and materials to their children. Now this is affecting state and local businesses and they're very concerned as well. So the Boston Business Journal was quoted as saying, Research shows that an inclusive education improves students' understanding, improves their behavior, and even improves their academic performance. This helps students to be successful in our classrooms, in our boardrooms, and in our democracy. So, what can concerned individuals and groups do? Write letters to the editor. Mm -hmm. Get in the newspaper about this issue. Write letters and emails to all your representatives and even more, like everyone in Idaho. <laughs> Show up at school board meetings. Um, those people are volunteers and they have been treated horribly and without regard. Show up at your city council meetings. Same thing with them. Mm -hmm. Tell your story about how libraries and librarians have affected your life. Stories are powerful. Share your stories, especially when you're talking to your representatives and different groups like that. And during the legislature, please testify. Please, please follow the Idaho legislature. It's super easy. I listened this morning. Uh, didn't testify this morning, but I've testified before. It's not difficult. Write what you need to write or you want to say, write it down before you testify. You'll be fine. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. So we have um, groups fighting against us and what we're trying to do in preserving our First Amendment rights. And the big national one that you probably heard about is Moms for Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have a grandma um, show up at a Lewiston School District board meeting and she began. She's actually started a Moms for Liberty group in Nez Perce County. Um, I think it was the first one in Idaho, too. It is. Okay, cool. Anyway, <laughs> um, she proceeded to read 
from a book that's in our high school library that did have very difficult content. I'm not gonna deny that it doesn't. But she only read, of course, the salacious parts. And when you apply what is called the Miller test, that book does not pass the Miller test because you have to judge the book as a whole. And if she had read that particular book in its entirety, she would have found out that this girl had no idea that the sexual abuse she was experiencing within her home was anything but normal. It had been a part of her life from the first memory and continued on. But it was a high school counselor who helped her recognize that this isn't right and this isn't normal and that's how she got help and yet that's the book this woman chose to read she didn't take into account that other people in the room might not want to hear that and so that's moms for liberty strategy she also ended up running for uh, Lewis and City Council and got shellac which I'm happy to say <laughs> sorry <laughs> Um, yeah, another group that's out there, and it's, I saw that, it's, it's called Moms for Libraries, and I'm like, yes, we need stuff like this. No. <laughs> they are a plan for Moms for Liberty. So when you see groups with these kind of monikers, you really have to do your research and say, well, what, what's behind what you're doing? And please, feel free to research what we're doing. We have cards for you. There's QR, or QR codes. You can... Look into what our um, support systems are. So along with Moms for Liberty, um, they use a specific rating system. It's called booklooks.org. And they look at specifically sexual words and things like that. And that they do not look at the book in its entirety. And libraries already have a cataloging system. And that cataloging system includes age-appropriate guidelines. So it's already there. Um, Oh, you know, I kind of made reference to the Miller test, which is a three-pronged test. And um, so, oh, yeah, what, whether the average person applying contemporary adult community standards, however you define that, finds a matter taken as a whole, what's its purpose, whether the average person applying contemporary adult community standards finds that the mat matter depicts or describes sex sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, and whether a reasonable person finds the matter taken as a whole lacks seriously literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. So one of the books at LHS that um, used to be taught with our junior US history class was a graphic novel, Mouse, by Art Stiegelman. It's wonderful. And the kids loved it, loved it so much. And now that is on all kinds of banned lists. And I, I mean, I've been out for a while. I don't know that that book is still being taught, but what I can tell you is when students were reading that in their US history classes during their Holocaust unit, they would come down to the library and say, do you have mouse too? And I would have holds lists on that. It really captured kids' imagination. But there's stuff in that book that, you know, one or two things I don't like. But this book, I love this. It's Baby's First Book of Banned Books. <laughs> <laughs> and Mouse is in there, and it says, I speak up when someone is in trouble. That's the theme of the book, right? There's so many in here. The Kite Runner, which are um, especially our honors English kids and our AP kids love the Kite Runner. And the theme, we're not so different in our minds. Why is it banned? Yeah. There's a uh, rape. There is, yes. There is. And that's why. And that's why. But again, how to find it. So, can you use the microphone, Rachel? Oh, sorry. So, on your tables are several handouts, information on our alliance and how to join. There's a QR code, as she said. Um, there are suggestions and prompts to get you started writing letters, um, along with some facts for you to quote and or expand on. And, um, um, go ahead. Yeah, just in conclusion, <laughs> neither a small vocal group nor our elected officials have the right to deny any of us, regardless of age, our constitutionally protected First Amendment rights. 
They do have the right to parent their own children, but they do not have the right to parent our children or anyone else's children. Please help us maintain our First Amendment rights. Before we open the floor for um, questions, Heather is going to tell her personal story, because remember, personal stories are powerful. I'm sure you can all hear me. Um, when I was a little girl, uh, my mom would go for her weekly grocery shopping, and she took me and my sister, and she would drop us off at our little community library, and then she would all go off you know, doing her thing, and then she'd come back and pick us up. In that library, I can still remember, you would walk in, and on this side were the children's books, and on this side were the adults' books. And so it went, I mean, I can still see them. All the little house on the prairie, <coughs> all, books, all the books I love. Well, at one point, I read them all that I wanted to, and so I wandered over to the other section, and the librarian wouldn't let me in. So my mom came back, gathered us up, and Heather, where are all your books? I said, well, the librarian wouldn't let me in. So my mom <laughs> marched back into that library and she told the librarian that as a parent, it was her decision what I could and could not read. It was not the librarian's decision. That was not her role. And I will tell you that from then on, I could go anywhere in the library I wanted. <laughs> and I grew up to be a librarian. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we, we would love to hear any of your questions, anything like that, anything that we can help you with. We'll try our very, very best. Go ahead. I didn't know um, about the cost issue, and I think that ought to be much more publicized, and I wondered if you had any numbers or um, documentation. Is that on, on our list or not? I don't know. I think there's some costs in there. I, there might be. We have, um, sorry, we have a synopsis of some uh, surveys that were taken, and I think that you're right. I think there might be some of the financial impacts on there, but that would be a really easy thing. We have a Facebook page if you're into that, and uh, if you join our alliance, you will also get emails. That's definitely something that we could update on there. It's more about the costs. And, um, Every library has fabulous fact sheets, and if there's specific stuff that you want specifically on cost, we will get it to you. Actually, I have a, a whole listing in my, that we can, we can do that. Or you just think nationally, not just locally. Oh yeah, because Texas and Florida is just yeah. a mess. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, there, the, the money down there is ridiculous. Yes. What is your Facebook name? Um, North Central Idaho Alliance. North Central. Fighting for the first, and it's a private group and so there's just three little questions we have people go through and, and you're welcome to join it. We'd love to have them. And grab one of the purple, kind of purpley cards. Yes. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by the lack of responsibility that anti-groups place upon parents. It's almost like the, the librarians, the, the staff, they get all the blame, but no one really uh, puts a lot of responsibility on parents. And I have a similar story in that when I was about 12 or 13, my mom was an avid reader. Somebody gave her a box of books and Peyton Place was in it. So I just kind of grab it up and I'm looking it over. And she says, I'm going to let you read that, but I do not want you to take it too seriously and we'll talk about it later. Excellent response. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I, I, I'm just curious as to why the responsibility of the parents kind of gets put by the wayside. You know, I, one of the things that's happening in Idaho and it's happening throughout the nation is that librarians are leaving. It's kind of the same thing that you hear about the doctors that are leaving Idaho due to our restrictive abortion laws. And so this is happening, you know, with librarians as well. And it's it's easy to blame and put blame on somebody else and not take responsibility. I, you know, I hear you, I hear you. I, if you check out a book and you don't like it, return it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, be, or be there to see yeah. what your child exactly. is checking yeah. out. Yeah. You know? This is mostly for school libraries, but um, I'm wondering, with Florida and Texas being two of the largest populations of school children, 
How is this affecting the publishers of Mike's Mike 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 Um Are they afraid to publish a lot of things now or just not publishing things that are kind of controversial? I don't see them um, being reluctant personally. I, I mean, I we have a representative from Pan America who um, was really supportive of our rally and sent books for people to read during the sit-in and whatnot. Um, I think the real ramifications are, might still happen. It's kind of like what happened with textbooks during the 80s when I was first getting into education, everything came out of Texas. So every textbook that went across America had to meet Texas standards. And that's when you got some of that crazy stuff about what the Civil War was about and things like that. So I don't know, I don't, but I've listened to a million podcasts on this topic and every time they, interview an author whose book has been censored or banned, they're not they're not regretful of what they've done or what they've said or what they've put out there because they know it's helping someone. And that's motivating. Mm -hmm. yeah, can they also censor like if you have a Kindle book and you want your I mean, how could they do that? You're a parent and you want your child or don't care if they read it, so how could they Censor that. If you got the Kindle, if you got the book through Libby, for right. example, yeah, that's an excellent question. Yeah, um, and that's one of the things that this particular group is grappling with. We are part of Valnet, and, and, and you know, there's some other librarians here in the audience that might want to tackle this question as well. Um, Valnet includes the Sultan County Library, which is across the river and in a different state. And so what happens if we have really restrictive things going to Idaho? How can I can I get that book out of the Sultan County? Can you show can you me that book? Because I want to read it. I don't know. I know that's a, those are excellent questions. Or honestly, anything from any Idaho Public Library, whether it's Moscow or Lewiston City Library, the schools in Lewiston, at least, are all in Valnet, right? Mm -hmm. So the kids have agency to go online and order a book from one of the public libraries and get that resource in. Now, is the librarian supposed to stand guard at the bookshelf where their holds are and say, mm, that's not my job, no. right? Mm -hmm. But that's, is that gonna be the next expectation mm -hmm. is that you also censor other people's collections? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a hard one. Mm -hmm. um, Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just, this question might be more for Chris. What impact have you seen here in Moscow? Have you had any um, requests to remove books? No, not, not recently. Okay. But we, we do have, um, so about this time last year, happens to coincide with the legislative session, right? <laughs> <laughs> we did have people bringing materials in either verbally or on a written comment form or maybe in an email or website comment saying they didn't like this, they didn't think other people would like it, they didn't think their child should read it or other children should read it, but nothing ever reached the formal challenge stage. Um, we, I was telling these two that we have been, in the past few weeks, been finding picture books that have been stuffed behind other picture books on the shelf and discovered by accident. And so some are like LGBTQ kinds of things or those kind of materials like that, but um, also there, the most recent two were, um, I guess, multicultural focus, uh, blended families, you know, disabled people on the cover, people with different colored skin. They were also put back there, and they're stuck like this. We've had two situations now where three books have been put at right angles, stuck behind the bookshelf, mm -hmm. not removed. And a few years ago, we we found similar books that had been put very pointedly in the trash can in, in the restroom. Like somebody was making a point that this is trash, but I'm not actually putting it down below and making sure you see what I think of this. So those are the kinds of things we've been seeing in our um, in our library system. Yes, will there be another read-in, freedom to read-in, say in Moscow? To uh, you're not the first one to ask. <laughs> we would love to do another one. 
it was it was so successful down there, and we would love to do another one either here or in Lewiston or or something you know along those lines. And if you would like to, please join us and tell us it's what we'll call you and say help us out, and we'll put one on. I did want to bring this to your attention, especially when you were asking about local stuff. So I only have one copy of each of these, but you're welcome to look at it um, when we close up. This is the list um, in this little plastic sleeve of uh, books that have actually been challenged, not, now there's a difference between a challenge and a ban, okay? Challenge is somebody doesn't like it and says, I don't like it and I think you should remove it. Now that doesn't mean it gets removed. It's just a challenge at that point. They go through the process and it become, and there they can, the library board or can decide that it is going to be taken out. These are challenges in Idaho. There aren't very many of them and this was finished in 2022. So it's not the 2023 titles. So that's something you might want to take a look at. Are those school libraries or public libraries? I think it doesn't matter. Okay. Titles challenged in Idaho. This was put together. Yeah, and it says, this list does not indicate why a title was challenged, only whether it contained LGBTQ or uh, content or characters. Or, and that was put together by the Idaho Library Association. Um, last year when um, the legislation came out to ban one of, um, there was a senator who actually sent me a list of possible challenges. And this is the list um, that she sent. And what it was is everything mostly in Southern Idaho that she, that had been found in school libraries and um, public libraries that she didn't particularly like. Um, and she was also sending this list to Northern Idaho so that they could check those libraries. When you look on the, the title of the book, underneath it, almost everything is booklooks.org is how she put this book, that's how she put this thing together. Yeah, yeah. so like a good librarian, <laughs> I look every single one of them up. <laughs> so will the kids. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And out of that list, a little over half were award winners. And I mean big award winners. We're talking about things that won the um, Prince, things that won the Caldecott, things that won the Newberry, things that won, that are Pulitzer Prize winning books. So, so, so you can look at that list too. Um, so it's very, very interesting as to, you know, yes, she didn't particularly like these books, but so many of them are award winners. Well, it's so futile. I mean, when I was a teenager, I remember going to the dictionary to learn <laughs> words. And are you going to take the dictionary out and have the word homosexual in it or transgender? Well, they, I, have you heard the joke? They're going to change the name to Shinary because there are no dicks. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's so futile. And you also have online all the time. And what uh, a former school district uh, principal told me, the kids are just making lists and they're going, to, they're going to find them. You know, it's, you're, you're calling attention to stuff they didn't even think about before. Well, well would exactly. the National Geographic magazine survive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just beautiful. And that's a retired science teacher. When are they going to go after, I mean, animals do weird things. The current legislation had not been put back to committee. One of the things I was really concerned about was anatomy books. Yeah. You could, there, there aren't no many. Because you know you can't you have to cover all this stuff up. So and what about Michelangelo's art books? What about what about Greek and Roman statues? Um, in response to um, Karen's question before, actually that reminds me we do we had several things come back with little post-it notes on yeah. it. Um, <laughs> transgender propaganda. Oh. And and it, novels coming or things coming back like graphic novels where a post-it note was put over cleavage or something like that. <laughs> you know, I, I a lot of people thought it would it stay in there. <laughs> so, so that's some of the other kind of responses we get at the library. Mm -hmm. um, currently, 
They're working on a new bill, from my understanding. And they're working towards more of a moving books from one area of the library to another, from the children's section or whatever, the young adult to the adult section. And there were several people, speaking of the cost that you mentioned before, several libraries, uh, librarians spoke up about that as well, cost, and a lot of my, in our rural libraries, they, they don't even have the opportunity no. to separate those mm -hmm. things in the space they have. So do you know anything more about what the current bill is looking like at all? No, I, the only thing that I can tell you is that um, there's always a question about the millages. That is, that is a really, really super important part. Um, and that's about all I can tell you. Can you seen, tell us what the millages are? Yeah, I can. Yeah. <laughs> it was a little bit what um, Marianne was talking about, about the fact that you can't just pick something, you can't pick a phrase out, you can't pick a word out and say, oh, it's bad, yeah. that you have to take it in its entirety, and also regarding um, literary value. I know, I know I should know this, but the, the Supreme Court, I don't remember the date, um, came up with this three-prong approach to deal with this when this comes up, whenever it comes up on First Amendment rights. The thing about the Miller test is it has to meet all three criteria, not one, not just one. So, um, like the Captain like Underpants the books have been banned because, well, a couple of reasons. They bodily functions, of course, that's offensive. And then um, <laughs> Captain Underpants is often topless. <laughs> <laughs> the cape isn't enough. And so anyway, but when you put that up against the Miller test, if you're gonna try and challenge or ban it, it has to pass all three of those criteria. And what are the three? So the first one, you want me to read the whole thing? The first one is whether the average person applying contemporary adult community standards finds that the matter taken as a whole appears appeals to the prurient interest, erotic, lascivious, abnormal, unhealthy, degrading, shameful, and morbid interest in nudity, sex, or excretion. <laughs> Number two, whether the re average person applying contemporary adult community standards finds that the matter depicts or describes sexual conduct in a patently offensive way, ultimate sexual acts, normal or perverted, actual or simulated, masturbation, excre excretory functions, lewd exhibition of the genitals, or sadomasochistic sexual abuse. Number three, whether a reasonable person finds that the matter taken as a whole lacks serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value. And they have to meet all three. Have to meet all three. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, how the efforts in the Idaho legislature to get Idaho taxpayers uh, to pay for religious schools um, which is going on right now, and how that fits in with the freedom to read issue. Mm -hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, you know, public libraries and school libraries, they don't, there's nothing, there's nothing having to do with religious anything. And those taxpayers, I don't know, that's a good question. Do we want our taxes going to religious schools or do we just want our taxes going to public? That's a, that's a question that we're gonna have to look at. The word indoctrination comes up. Well, yes it does. Mm -hmm. But well, and on private, both sides. <laughs> private, private schools absolutely have that right. Yeah. Right? I mean, they, mm -hmm. that's what they could do. But public schools need to represent numerous views and opinions on that sort of thing. So like at Lewiston High School when I was there, we had the Bible on the shelf, we had um, the Book of Mormon, we had the Talmud, we had the, the essential religious works because kids would use them in their research or whatever and if they wanted to read them. And then with popular <coughs> fiction, things come along like the Tim LaHaye uh, Left Behind series, apocalyptic Christian fiction. That was really popular with a bunch of my kids and you bet I bought it, they were reading it, that's what they wanted. Do I agree with it? Doesn't matter if I agree with it or not, right? But we're a public school and we welcome all. We, we both of us have stories of, of parents or 
people calling, complaining about one book or another, or my favorite was uh, we would have a Harry Potter program every single time the new one came out, and there were seven of them, and um, I get call, I would get a call every party that that was inappropriate, and it was magic, and I shouldn't have a party at the library. It's just, this is, you know, everybody has their own opinion, and everybody's allowed to have their opinion. They really are. I'm not allowed to tell other people what they can and cannot read. That's the thing. Personally, my issue with the vouchers, though, among other things, is that, you know, that's going to be, if the vouchers go through the $5,000 that they're proposing, that's my tax money, your tax money, everybody's tax money, right? And we get no say. At a public library, a public school, you have say. Yeah. So it's it's a struggle to see it as something that should be funded. Personally, personally, I speak for no one but myself. <laughs> you know, this is what's so nice is we're retired, <laughs> and we don't want to make life worse for our colleagues. No. Yes. In a way, this is unrelated, but it is a matter. How many, and you're, because you're both retired, how many people have you dealt with, staff, librarians of one sort or another, who are considering retiring early, leaving the state, getting out of the library business? Because I find it a deep concern that all of our schools mm -hmm. at all levels are having difficulty, whether it's a kindergarten teacher or a counselor or whatever, of finding qualified people to come on to our school district staffs. Have you had any Ex expose, ex what's the word about? Have you been exposed to any of that? Have people talked to you and said, I'm gonna retire early or whatever? Well, I think we should tell her about Denise. So um, there is an award by the American Library Association mm -hmm. yep. and it is called the Lemony Snicket. Yep. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna say it right. The Lemony Snicket, something for adverse conditions in the library. I, that's not right. <laughs> but anyway, um, anyway, and um, there was a librarian in northern Idaho that had what was called the Rainbow Squad, and it was a um, program for high schoolers. Well, and I don't know if it was down to junior high. She's looking it up. What a librarian! <laughs> anyway, um, uh, they could come after school, and it was for LGBTQ plus youth their friends, whatever, and it was it was really contentious. At one point they had armed guards so that these kids could get in. Um, so she got this amazing award. <laughs> and um, I mean, throughout the entire United States, they picked her, her name's Denise Najjar, and she actually spoke down in, at the rally. Um, she no longer works in Northern Idaho. Is that common? I don't, I don't know how common, but I mean, I, that's when you asked, I thought, well, that's probably the best example that we know. I do know we have fewer and fewer credentialed librarians in yes. schools. Mm -hmm. And that's. Mm -hmm. I think she moved to Texas, though. Yeah. Oh, no. Okay. Texas or Florida was where she was going. <laughs> so, the Lemony Snicket Prize for Noble Librarians Faced Noble. with Adversity. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is of the opinion of Lemony Snicket, author, reader, and alleged malcontent that librarians have suffered enough. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here. <laughs> also, there's also the Boundary County Director that's been yeah. under a lot of... Oh, yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Closed in meetings because there were people coming from... Yeah. And she left the state too, I believe. Maybe she's the one that moved. One of them went yeah, to I the Texas. Was Denise who was yeah. Yeah. I think Denise went to Illinois, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. I think she went to the Boundary County. Yes, I bet. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is the end game, do you think, of this whole thing just to close down libraries? ban the books and I wonder also if it's people whose children aren't in public schools who are challenging the books and the end game is just to close down public schools and libraries yeah well as personally personally I, I think you have a very valid point mm -hmm. and um, yes a lot of them are that are complaining or you know not liking what they see 
are don't have kids in public school. No, that's not all of them. I mean, you know, that's just a, but that, that does, that is true. And yeah, and I think, you know, the one big thing that I think is changing when parents come in and they're concerned about something is we used to start with the discussion. Like, if, what about, you know, how can we maybe mitigate this or, or fix it to make it work for you and your family? And if that's not appealing, then we put forth the censorship challenge, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's gonna be t tough to have those conversations because people are so scared. And I, for the life of me, have no, no idea what motivates these cultural wars, basically, what we're facing today. I mean, who ever thought librarians would be <laughs> so vilified or the, the act of going and choosing something to read for free, you know, would be questioned. And, and yet that's where we are. And we're just really worried about especially vulnerable populations. <coughs> we just want them to be represented. In the back socket. There is a theory that says in the oligarchy, you need to keep the serfs as uneducated as possible. <laughs> organizations in this country dedicated to killing the public schools. Yeah, I was just thinking about the era of the rise of Nazism and how important it was to not only uh, eliminate books in libraries, but to put them in great piles and to set them afire so all the public could see and so you have to really look at motivation as central to this whole question. And if it does start with just a few people who have a few objections and put post-it notes in books, you have to wonder what the end game might be. Absolutely, and they, um, when you look at Nazi Germany, when they started, um, um, making sure that none of the Jewish elite could, you know, be you know, college professors, you know, none of them were allowed to, to teach anymore. One of the things they did is they took out all the librarians. <laughs> so they took the librarians out, several were sent to the concentration camps. Um, in your opinion, do you see the situation as getting worse and deteriorating, or are you optimistic that your efforts around these kinds of things will help the situation? 400 people, almost 400 people showed up in Boise in the middle of a snowstorm. Then another 400, maybe the same ones, I don't know, <laughs> on Monday, I can't, you know, on Monday, again, in horrible weather, came to the, to testify uh, against this particular bill. So that gives me hope. I'm, I'm also optimistic. I really, I do think people say, no, this is too far. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Sure. Because my parents were Holocaust survivors, and my, they came after the war to Montreal, uh, where I grew up. And um, as my mother worked in the way that they were always working, you know, morning to night. So the library was my safety, safe place, you know. That's where I would go on my bike and spend the day on the weekends, or whatever, because my parents were at work. And they certainly couldn't judge what I was reading. It was, you know, I mean, I could read what I wanted to read, um, but just the safe place for children whose parents do work for them, as my parents did in factories or at restaurants, you know. And unfortunately, some of that trust has been lost. But that was the reason Carnegie built all the small libraries. And that was exactly why he wanted <coughs> the common man, is what he said. He wanted them to be able to educate themselves. Yeah. That's what came about. Those all those little Carnegie libraries all the way around. That was the that was why. So I just one thing I want to add to is I mean people are I don't want to dismiss concerns people have about the proliferation of pornography in society, but I think the fact of the matter is that the true predators are online. They're on these things these kids carry around and and you know I'd rather efforts to address that. Schools and public libraries for kids under 18 have, uh, because of SIPA uh, legislation that requires 
filters on all our internet software. So we are making every effort to stop that, that vulnerable children are doing way more of this to get caught up in horrible things than sitting in a library reading a book. And that, and that was on TV this morning, Zuckerberg, oh, and a gentleman uh, who's the CEO of TikTok were in front of Congress. Good. You had a comment. They were putting it to him. Oh, I was wondering, what's the status of the Dayton Library? Because they were going to close it uh, in Washington uh, because of what was happening over there with the, the public. Do you know? Yeah, it didn't happen, but I don't know. Um, can you talk to that better? Because it, no. I, all I know is that it, was, it wasn't at a judge. Yeah, I feel like it was a story in the Tribune yesterday or to, and probably the Daily News as well about that there's, yeah, they settled that, that the way they handled that election was, in, I don't know what legal term they used, but not good. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like there's legislation now moving through Washington's Congress dealing to prevent that again. Well, if any library survives, it will survive in Washington. I mean, you know, right. with legislative, with the climate of the, the politics and stuff, I mean, I could see where if the, the Dayton Library would survive, it was a, I don't know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. We have, there are several um, handouts over there. We welcome you to come and get them. One of them is a list of all your legislators how to get a hold of them. And yep, there she goes. There's, there's Vanna over there. And um, it, uh, so if you have, please write letters, you know, they're very, very, very helpful. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that HB 341 was, was brought back was because of all the intense um, uh, writing, testimonies, letters, everything. They went, oh, maybe we should change a little bit of this. So do that. And there's also the our, our little postcard to, and there's a QR code on the back. There's how to, how to write a letter and what you can do kind of things. There's some prompts. So please come and get anything that you would like. And there's a lovely picture of Marianne and her dogs from the Lewiston Tribune this morning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, oh thank you. You exemplify what LEAD stands for, and that's acronym. Oh, oh and yeah. I just want to remind people in case you didn't know, Heather recently rejoined the lead. She was a lead member yeah. years ago and she's rejoined, so she's a perfect example. And with your mother being in the league, I joined the league. <laughs>